good morning good afternoon to all the participants uh, uh, so welcome to the second day uh, second session of the five day online faculty development program on uh, sustainable design with uh, pre engineering techniques towards eco friendly uh, buildings so today we are honored to have uh, architect architect uh, raman vig with us today so sir is a founder of bioenergetic architecture in new delhi uh, it, it's a long list of his achievements and uh, the brief introduction to his profile does not do justice to whatever sir has achieved uh, he's a certified uh, building biology consultant for institute of bio biology ibn germany uh, sir is also a certified vastu Uh, Varshad, uh, he's got a certification from Veda Vigyan Mahavidya Pita, Bangalore. Uh, sir is a visiting faculty uh, for the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, also the World University of Design, Sonapet. Uh, he's a studio advisor for ABRD, New Delhi. Sir was also a former design principal of Studio Lotus, New Delhi. He's a former associate director of RSP Design Consultants, India. he is an internal expert on board of studies for world university of design sonapet sir has also given guest lectures and constantly gives guest lectures at various prestigious institutes uh, iit roorkee and uh, state of university of planning and visual arts rohtak for just to name a few raman sir specializes in designing architecture for well being he is based out of new delhi and is founded his bio energetic architecture which is a unique domain that integrates the knowledge of subtle in energies of space and human biofields as a layer of architectural design with the objective to facilitate health happiness and harmony in the lives of people through space design he has 25 years of domain experience of designing and executing more than 20 million square feet of diverse range of architectural and master planning projects he extends architectural design consultancy and mentor design teams into the science of designing architecture for holistic well being through talks and workshops he is also an associate studio advisor and mentor to renowned architecture design practices in 2018 after more than two decades of spearheading various architectural design positions and projects he decided to deep dive into his passion of designing architecture for holistic well being his research culminated in the creation of his signature nine perspectives of bioenergetic architecture which systematically brings together the design principle of ancient veda science and ayud vastu and thickets of building biology and related subtle energy sciences in a unified manner in any kind of design of built environment his recent projects involved the design of extension of premium wellness resort by the name of shantam at rishikesh based on bio energetic architecture he offers concept design packages for all of project all types of projects especially houses and resorts across india for his clients which integrate his nine perspectives of bio energetic design sir after graduating from the school of planning and architecture in new delhi he practiced in delhi for over 12 years in 2008 he had associated with rsp design consultants he has facilitated the setting up of rsp gurgaon office as an associate director in 2015 he had teamed up with lotus studios in their as a design principal where he was instrumental in gearing up the team to deliver large scale architectural projects including krishi bhavan at bhuvaneshwar which was a judge winner at the prestigious international az awards 2020 arc asia awards as well as the hutko design awards 2019-20 under the green building category sir on behalf of the department of civil engineering here at dsatm i extend a very warm welcome to you we are all eager to eagerly looking forward to your talk uh, we basically being civil engineers bioengineering bioenergy and architecture is something new 
and uh, this i think uh, will lead to a lot of research opportunities for all of us uh, especially on the teaching front sir once again i welcome you uh, to the session uh, i'll hand over the stage to you sir sir uh, you you you're on mute uh, you can can you unmute yourself sir you're on mute thank you very much girish can you hear me now yes sir I, we can hear you okay uh, namaskar and a very good morning to all of you let's start this session with a little bit of imagination when was the last time that you went to a new place and as you entered you suddenly felt uncomfortable and just wanted to leave that place and for no apparent reason or try to imagine an instance where you or anybody you know of uh, want to buy a new flat and you have seen many properties but then you enter this one property or a flat and suddenly it feels like being at home it feels right and you suddenly say yes let's close the deal so if you can associate or relate with any of these instances then you're going to enjoy this session because i'm going to introduce a little known field of architecture with you so this forum is more about sustainability and conservation but i'll take your permission to detour a bit and introduce sustainability from a whole new perspective from the perspective of the domain, uh, a, a new domain of built environment known as bioenergetic architecture. But uh, uh, I'll just share my screen. Girish, can you please confirm if you can yes, see sir. my screen? Yes, sir. The screen is visible. Not an issue. Okay, wonderful. So before we proceed further to dive deep into this subject, I would like to give you a brief of how bioenergetic architecture happened to me. How is it that today I am talking to you on this subject? So for this, let's take a little journey down the memory lane. Okay, so for past two decades or more, I've been very fortunate to be part of some amazing offices and to have handled diverse projects uh, from institutions to housing, to industries, to uh, interiors. And many of them went over green buildings. They were gold rated and platinum rated buildings and uh, many of them went on to win national awards and uh, international awards. All in all, it was a most exciting journey into various realms, various type of clients and various climates also, because all of these projects are pan India. This project, Trishi Bhavan, is especially close to my heart. This is something that uh, we, we did together with the Studio Lotus. And last year it won uh, run, runners up in World Architecture Festival. And subsequently uh, it won a prestigious, it's the first government building in India to have ever won an international award. That's the AZ award. Uh, and net net, it has been the most gratifying journey. And uh, oh, we're in a lot of scare footage, a lot of diversity, and a lot of uh, experience of meeting wonderful people happened for me. But this is not really what I'm going to discuss today. This is important because this was the this formed the basis of what I'm going to share with you today. So most of you might be aware that in any kind of design, there are primarily three main pillars, you know, and it was way back in 1 BC that a Roman architect come journal, he, he coined this uh, terms utilitas, vinustas and fermitas as key elements of good architecture. 
utilitas as you, as you can see is purpose and function and vinistas is beauty and grace formitas is structural stability and robustness and then of late what has happened is those of you who are connected with the field would also realize that cost time and quality have become very important pillars of design in today's uh, times and for past two three decades sustainability and environment have also become very centric to all kind of architectural narratives so these six or seven pillars were my main uh, you know guidelines on which i practiced over past 20 25 years but something was missing and i felt that i was not really able to touch the lives of people in a manner that i wanted to the human well being was something which i had not been able to impact that was my own assessment and that is where i raised this question to myself that can there be an architecture which facilitates health happiness and harmony and that was the beginning of the journey uh, for architecture for well being and that's how eventually in 2019 this initiative this new domain of bioenergetic architecture was formed now this word may be new to some of you bioenergetic per se means is the science of energy exchange between living systems and their environments and with and and bioenergetic is actually a very well established field of medicine in europe where you, they are using this principle in healthcare. When we translate this principle into uh, as a design, as a methodology of space design, that becomes bioenergetic architecture. But this is a very unusual kind of, uh, you know, uh, collection of many, many different kind of domains. So it's not very easy, uh, straightforward to explain this. So what I'm trying to do is today share with you five different small stories. They will together, they may seem very disjointed to you, but eventually at the end, they'll all come together to give you an overall picture of what bioenergetic architecture is. And each story would have certain uh, videos with it. And uh, at the end of each, uh, there is a certain thought I wanted to leave you with. And I would urge you that throughout this, there might be certain new concepts that you come across. There might be some inquiries or questions that come to your mind. Please keep a note of them so that towards the end, we can have a very heart to heart discussion about this is a new field. And I would, I would like to share all my research with you, whatever way I can. So with that, let's start with our story number one for the day. You know, when I entered as a student uh, at SPA Delhi uh, in early 90s, uh, I came across this statement by Winston Churchill. We shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. And this got me thinking. And throughout 20, 25 years, I have been trying to go deeper into the statement that can buildings actually affect us that much? If they do, then how? And what is the language of communication between our body and the buildings? How to decode this language? Can we really design positive spaces? If yes, then how? So the answer to all this uh, started coming when I started researching from the statement made by Nikola Tesla. If you wish to understand universe, think of energy, frequency and vibration. And I'm sure in the audience, there are so many engineers that these terms would not be unfamiliar to you. So I'll move on that even Einstein said something to a similar effect everything is energy and that's all there is to it match the frequency of the reality you want and you cannot help but get that reality it can be no other way this is not philosophy this is physics so i 
show you a small clipping and uh, uh, this clipping will set the tone of, of the direction we are going to go in this talk. Uh, Girish, kindly confirm if the audio video is fine. To understand the foundations of the universe, first we have to understand the language in which it speaks. The energetic, universal language, the foundation of all creation, is light. Light creates a pattern of energy movement which can be seen as specific shapes. These shapes are geometry. Geometry is defined as the blueprint of our universe. The underlying principle being mathematics, form and rhythm. All matter, all elements come from this alphabet of simple shapes, starting with the circle, the mother of all creation, with no beginning and no end. The circle, when replicating itself in order to experience relationship, forms the vesica Pisces. If it continues to repeat itself in this way, it forms the pattern from which all creation is birthed, the flower of life. This pattern this language can be seen in nature, music, architecture, astrology, and your DNA. They all communicate in this universal language represented by the patterns of geometry. Through forming a conscious communion with this universal language of energetic patterns, we begin to unlock dormant potential within ourselves, which lies sleeping deep within our divine human instruments. Human beings are bioelectrical systems made up of cell membranes which can be thought of as minuscule antenna, able to detect, translate and utilize this geometric language of light. Each cell in our bodies acts as a broadcaster, receiving and transmitting the energy which flows through the environment in order to produce charge. Everything in our environment carries an electromagnetic field, an EMF, invisible to the human eye. Environmental exposures to artificial EMFs can interact with fundamental biological processes in the human body. We receive EMFs from our sun and our earth, which sync harmoniously with our natural frequency. Our bodies, however, not able to differentiate between natural EMFs and man-made EMFs, causing a frequency pollution in our atmosphere and throwing our bodies out of their natural alignment. Okay, so I want you to keep the contents of this uh, small clipping in your mind. We talked about various things here and we talked also about artificial EMFs. So we will go deeper into it, but essentially I want to introduce you to the law of vibration. This law states that nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. And this entire universe and everything comprises of pure vibratory energy. The universe has no solidity as such. Matter is merely energy in state of vibration. And even our thoughts and intentions have vibrational frequencies. So vibration and resonance is something that we all are familiar with. You know, this is, this is class 10th, 12th uh, physics. So how objects of different frequency impact each other to understand this, which is essentially uh, the basis of resonance. You would, some of you would be relating to that. I'll show you another clipping, which. Uh... Uh, this clipping, these uh, uh, gadgets are called as metronomes. And you can move each one of them, give them a different frequency, and that's precisely what they are doing right here. Please watch them closely.
one is the right hand column, and the second one is the right hand side. So, what was happening to these metronomes? It seems that the metronomes were communicating with each other, right? They were they were oscillating separately on separate frequencies in the beginning, and then as time progressed, they all achieved a common frequency, right? <clears throat> the lone metronome with a different frequency, which you saw that on the right hand side there was on the the second one on the right, that was still different. And eventually, it also resonated with all of them. You know, human beings are not much different from metronomes. We also get impacted by predominant vibrations around us. The vibrations are not only the sound vibrations, music vibrations, everything, as we saw in the earlier slide, everything in our environment has is, is vibratory field. Matter, like they said, is essentially energy at a very low vibration the this is what was happening and if you remember uh, even the people we keep company with the thoughts we welcome the videos we watch the books we read the knowledge we acquire all those are thought vibrations that we are inculcating so just like metronomes get affected by the predominant vibration around them similarly human beings also get to align and with with the predominant vibration in which we are you know that's why uh, our grandmothers and our parents used to say no, keep good company you know so that you also start vibrating at the same frequency because our mind our thoughts are also vibrations so since we are all into the field of building and we are talking of construction do vibrations have shape and form We'll try to connect this because <clears throat> ultimately that's what we are trying to see in this uh, uh, interaction. There is a field called cymatics and some of you may be familiar with this field, may have even seen this video. This field establishes the relation between sound waves or vibrations and their corresponding shapes. So let's have a small glimpse at this. So maybe uh, you notice that uh, uh, as the frequency was increased, the pattern started becoming more and more complex. So a thought is, if every vibration has a unique pattern to it, then is it possible that every pattern, every shape, form also has a unique vibrational signature? So. I want you to stay with this thought as we move forward and try to see how do vibrations really impact human beings. Here I would want to introduce you to the concept of biofield. So most of us may be familiar with this concept of prana or life energy, you know, in various cultures it's known as ki or Chinese call it, uh, uh, call it qi. 
it's of late in past uh, a couple of decades that contemporary science has also started to recognize that biofield is a matrix of natural electromagnetic fields that connect the cells, tissues, organs, and serve as the main communication network. It's the main regulator of life. We need to understand that we are essentially electrical beings. This is a very important uh, statement I would urge you to pay attention to and keep in your mind because as we go forward, everything start will start tying up with this particular thing. Now, energy imbalances and blockages can occur in the biofield due to trauma, stress, abuse, deficiencies, and computers, TV, cell phones, and other electronic devices. When our cells are not able to communicate with each other, that is when disease happens. So now we have got gadgets which can take photograph of the biofield. And on the left hand side, you can see the image of a healthy biofield. And it gets distorted in case there's a disease. In fact, when it gets distorted, that is when the disease starts happening. Now, some of you may be aware of this uh, uh, concept of chakras. These are nothing but energy nodes. And the biofield within our bodies managed through the, this network of meridians and chakras. And most significant of these are these seven energy hubs. These are essentially, they relate to the plexus of uh, uh, nerve networks that control the functioning of numerous organs. So we have from crown to root chakra, we have these seven chakras, which are responsible for the corresponding uh, area and the organs in that region. They say a disease is known to appear as a disruption of corresponding chakra six to eight weeks before it manifests at the physical level. Therefore, now any positive or negative influence of the environment will first appear as good or bad health of energy chakra. And each of the chakra has been allocated a color and you would Appreciate that color is nothing but a certain light frequency. You can see on the right hand side, each chakra has a certain frequency. That means that frequency of light can stimulate that chakra. So if we were to recap this story, we understood that everything in our environment, all forms, colors, shapes, including people, their thoughts and intentions is communicating with our biofield. And this is continuously happening at the subtle level. Our biofield is also influenced by vibrations and information fields in our built environment of from the earth and from the cosmic energies. So we can control the effect of environment on our biofield by controlling the cause through space, sound, colors, geometry, and conscious intent. And this is the science behind bioenergetic architecture. So remember, in the beginning, we started with this question that what is the communication? What is the method by, by which our environment impacts us? So this is in a very short way to tell you that we are all nothing but vibrations and the human vibrations are impacted by many things, including our shape and uh, including our built environments and that is the relation of architecture or the built environment to human beings so with this let's move on to the second story and this if you remember during the first video they talked about artificial emfs emf is electromagnetic fields they are also called as emrs electromagnetic radiations and most of you would be familiar with it because it's a lot in, uh, uh, in talk these days so let's have a look at this small clip clipping uh, that will come after this so the fact is today each one of us absorbs 
as much electromagnetic radiation in 30 seconds as our grandparents absorbed in their entire lives. Some estimates say that between the 70s and now, almost 50 years, there's a gazillion time increase in the artificial uh, electromagnetic radiation in our environments. And scientific data on the biological effect of radio frequency indicate that there needs to be an immediate need for a precautionary approach to protect the public. And not only human beings, all life forms are impacted by this. Please try to appreciate that electromagnetic radiation is nothing new to our environment, our planet. The sun is throwing light through electromagnetic radiation. It's nothing new. What is new and what is dangerous in a way is a sudden expansion of the intensity of this in our environment. So through millions of years, human beings and life forms have evolved in a certain nature of electromagnetic spectrum. And now suddenly man has increased it many folds. Let's have a look at this. Something surrounds you, bombards you, some of which you can't see, touch, or even feel. Every day, everywhere you go, it is odorless and tasteless, yet you use it and depend on it every hour of every day. Without it, the world you know could not exist. What is it? Electromagnetic radiation. This spectrum is the foundation of the information age and of our modern world. Your radio, remote control, text message, television, microwave oven, even a doctor's x-ray, all depend on waves within the electromagnetic spectrum. So, as you sit watching TV, not only are there visible light waves from the TV striking your eyes, but also radio waves transmitting from a nearby station, and microwaves carrying cell phone calls and text messages, and waves from your neighbor's Wi-Fi, and GPS units in the cars driving by. There is a chaos of waves from all across the spectrum passing through your room right now. With all these waves around you, how can you possibly watch your TV show? Similar to tuning a radio to a specific radio station, our eyes are tuned to a specific region of the EM spectrum and can detect energy with wavelengths from 400 to 700 nanometers, the visible light region of the spectrum. So this is partly true, partly false. It's true that eyes can detect the visible spectrum. It is false that we do not, our body does not recognize the other range of frequencies. Our cells, and we have various kinds of cells in our body, they are continuously bombarded by this myriad mix of vibrations and they are getting affected by it. But now I would want to bring your attention to a very interesting research that happened way back in 90s. So, each one of you, I want you to recollect that in past, since past three or four years, have you experienced that you enter into a room in your house and suddenly you forget why you, why you entered? You pick up your phone to make a call and you forget whom did I want to make a call? And you get out of your car and you head back home and you forget, did I, uh, did I lock the car or no? These are momentarily lapse of memories. I do not know how many of you I cannot see in this online forum, a raise of hands, but believe me, throughout my talks in live talks in past uh, uh, three years, every time I ask the audience, everyone from teenagers to young adults to senior citizens, they raise their hands and they say, yes, we are experiencing this momentarily loss of memory very often, much more often than earlier. And lo and behold, look at this research. This is way back in 1990 that they found a connection between EMF and Alzheimer's disease. And they even figured that female subjects were shown to be at even a greater risk, 3.8 times the normal risk of developing such impacts. So what is it? It's the fact is that way back in 90s, science was aware that 
artificial man-made frequencies have a detrimental impact on the human brain because brain is also using frequencies to communicate. Now, what you see on the screen right now is another live blood analysis. On the left-hand side, it's a controlled blood, blood test of human subject, which is not exposed to EMR. And right-hand side, the blood test of human exposed to EMR generated by cell phone only for five minutes. Now you see, the, the, these uh, uh, cells, uh, they are basically, you know, RBCs, which, uh, which take oxygen. They have stuck together. And when they get stuck together, their net surface area reduces. This is called as rollio formation. And when it reduces, their ability to exchange oxygen with the system reduces. And this is just five minutes of cell phone exposure. Now, this is a MRA. MRA is nothing but a planned section slicing section of our brain. So on the left hand side, you see the brain without the exposure to cell phone radiation. And what you see as yellow, broadly, I think it's, it's a small in size. Yellow one is the safe kind of thing. And then on the right hand side, red triangles and the black ones are poor and bad and danger levels. So this is what happens the moment our head gets exposed to electromagnetic radiations. This is a research from France which uh, mapped that from a cell tower, if you have you are staying 300 meters or I think two to 300 meters within that radius, then how people have experienced, you can see headaches, difficulty on concentration, memory loss, irritability, skin diseases, sleep disturbance, depression, and so on and so forth. So as you see, as you go away, these instances keep on reducing. Now, when we come to kids, their skull thickness is much less than the skull thickness of human being. So the impact of radiation on kids is much, much more than it is on a adult. And there was an independent study in Sweden last year concluded that an astonishing 420% increased chance of getting brain cancer for those cell phone users who were teenagers or younger when they first started using their cell phones. There's this website and there is my site also. You can go and you can check out these papers. These are white papers, research papers, which are out there. And, you know, all these countries have banned Wi-Fi in their schools. We still have schools which advertise that we are Wi-Fi and we are smart schools. But look, this is the reality of smartness in true sense. <clears throat> so some thoughts. The original purpose of building was to prevent, uh, uh, you know, uh, save human beings from the danger of weather, wild animals, and even fellow human beings. When it when architecture started, that was the purpose. How can building in 21st century play a similar role to protect us from the new age danger of man-made radiations? And does this also involve a relook into our lifestyle and personal choices? This is a very important question. Now let's come to story number three. This is my favorite story. Water is fluid computer. And I would show you the small clipping first before we discuss it further. Water has memory. Experiments done in many countries around the world have shown that water receives and makes an imprint of any outside influence, remembering everything that occurs in the space that surrounds it. As it records information, water acquires new properties, yet its chemical composition remains unchanged. The structure of water is much more important than the chemical composition. The structure of water means how its molecules are organized. 
we can see how water molecules join together into groups. These are called clusters. Scientists came up with the idea that these clusters work as memory cells of a certain sort, in which water records the whole history of its relationship with the world, as if on magnetic tape. People don't think when you turn on the light, the water is changing. When you turn on the electric field from the power lines, the water may change. So that is the direction of research. The water, of course, remains water, but its structure, like a nervous system, reacts to any irritation. The stability of the cluster structures confirm the hypothesis that water is capable of recording and storing information. It may be the single most malleable computer, which can, that it's like a computer memory. It's the memory of information. In 1995, Dr. Emoto Masaru was the first one to record musical impressions on water. In Dr. Emoto Masaru's laboratory, they allowed water to listen to music, after which they flash froze the water. And then, under the microscope, they could clearly see the crystals that the water had formed. Here's what the music of Bach looks like. Mozart, heavy rock. Somebody said thank you to this water. Excuse me. You disgust me. In nature, Rivers and streams always flow along a smoothly curving course. But any water supply system has multiple right angle turns. The natural structure of the water breaks down more and more with each such turn. Water from a water supply system which flows into our homes through pipes has various forms, crystals of various forms but they are all deformed. That is, it may look like this. It can look like this or have these crystals in many other arrangements, but you won't see any symmetry or beauty. Here, the water was frozen in a cryogenic chamber and photographed under the microscope. The crystals of the tap water the crystals of the structured water So I was very fascinated when I started researching in this area. And I want to tell you that structured water is, uh, is called by various names. Vitalized water, water X, living water, hexagonal water, easy water. And, you know, when water is structured, it is rebalanced, just like its molecular composition when it is in nature. Structured water is the kind of water found in living plants and animals. They say it's the closest composition of as the water found in our cells. It is water molecules lined up in an orderly fashion and this type of orderly water can enter cells easier and better hydrate them. So you see uh, there is unorganized water on the right hand side and there is hexagonal structured water on the left hand side. And the same thing is a molecular structure of the borewell water and of a structured water. So I did not want to believe anything because I have this nature of testing out everything myself before I start believing. So I did an experiment. After research of many months, I figured out one gadget which uh, I thought I'll try out. So I installed that gadget in a way that in my house now, there are two lines which come from overhead tanks. One is with the structured water, one is a normal water. So this is the experiment that was done, I think last year, 2020, wherein uh, nine seeds were taken of, you may be aware of this barley jong that we, we, we sow, usually during festivals also. 
and they grow very fast. So it's very easy to ex experiment. So one of them was given normal tap water. The other was given structured water. And this is how their growth was measured day after day. And just within nine days, you see, this is the response that was visible. On the ninth day, the structured water seeds on the right hand side, non structured normal water on the left hand side. And that's when, when I mapped them, I figured that the structured water seed showed 50% more rate of growth, and all nine seeds germinated. Five of the nine seeds germinated in normal water, and that is when a whole new understanding dawned upon me that you know throughout all the cultures in the world especially the vedic culture water has got relevance in all our rituals so what are mantras now now some of you are familiar with mantras would know that in every ritual we have got mantras which are sound energy vibrations of a certain kind and water is used and in all religions uh, Let's let's talk of a Gurudwara. So usually you would find a sarovar or a pond around a Gurudwara. What's happening is Gurbani is being uh, uh, sung throughout 24-7 and those sound vibrations are being absorbed by the water. So somewhere one feels that our ancestors understood the ability of water as information carrier. With more than 70% of our body being made of water, how can we integrate water in our lives in such a manner using design that the ingrained memory and this quality of water can energize us and we can use it in our life more than for landscape and just for washing and for drinking can it become something more so i want to leave you with this thought and that let's move on to our fourth story and that is decoding shape power. I'm sure many of you would have heard about pyramids, but let's look at the small clicking, clipping first. All the Russian pyramids are made of fiberglass with the largest standing an incredible 144 feet high, tall, and weighing in at over 55 tons. This Russian pyramid is a modern wonder. Many different experiments are being done using these pyramids. They include studies in medicine, ecology, agriculture, physics, and health sciences. What is significant about this work is that it is being carried out by top scientists in Russia and Ukraine and not fringe elements or unknown inventors. Some of the amazing pyramid power research being done is showing great promise for all mankind. You may find this hard to believe, but some of the results include water inside the pyramid that will remain liquid to minus 40 degrees Celsius but freeze instantly if bumped in any way. There are reports of spontaneous charging of capacitors. Seismic activity near the pyramid research areas are reduced in severity and size and even to a non-existent point in some areas. Violent weather also appears to decrease in the vicinity of the pyramids. And there has also been a study into improved regeneration of tissue in humans and amazingly, they have built one of these things where there was a hole in the ozone and it appears to have fixed it. The so this was the study which was carried out in 2018 in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And they discovered that how this shape is able to channelize, concentrate, focus electromagnetic energy through the hidden chambers. This is all available on that. You can check it out. And I'm sure those who are staying in Bangalore would be aware there's a pyramid valley also there. And they are using this quality of pyramid towards inner growth and meditation. So scientists have found that pyramid concentrates electric and magnetic energy in its chambers and below the base, giving rise to distinct pocket of higher energy. So some thoughts. How can we integrate the power of pyramids in our space and building design effectively? Is it possible that like pyramid, all other shapes and volumes also have some kind of energy channelizing property? Can we explore the energy channeling properties of 3D shapes and 2D patterns? 
so as to have a positive impact on our well-being. So with this, let's move on to our final story. The world of geopathic stress. Geopathic stress occurs due to disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. Now, this is a relatively new phenomena for many of us, but per se, this has been researched since last centuries extensively. But somehow, that knowledge which I'm going to share with you, which I uh, uh, got to know through my research, has been known way beyond uh, 70, 80 years. Now, why geopathic stress should concern us in the first place? So there is a renowned cancer specialist, Dr. Napier, and according to him, 92% of all his cancer patients were geopathically stressed. Dr. Hartman, a German scientist, says that cancer is a disease triggered off by geopathic stress of that location, or put it simply, cancer is a locational disease. Now, these are very, very strong statements. And in Austria and Germany, before one builds a house or school, it is recommended the site be checked for geopathic stress. So what exactly is geopathic stress? So let's understand geopathic stress is the natural radiations or the distortion of magnetism of the Earth with weak electromagnetic fields, which are created sometimes by underground running water due to presence of certain minerals, underground cavities or faults. And way back in 1930s, George Lakoswi, he coined the term geopathic. And he said geopathic stress causes the human body to vibrate at higher frequency than normal and can affect the immune system. So you see, way back in before the middle of last century, this thing had been known. And this is how you can visualize. You may have seen some of the trees that look like in the picture below, you know, they have got these clumps, lumps kind of development. And always there is a geopathic line which is known to pass underneath. So this is a kind of cancerous growth for the tree. Now, there are different kind of geopathic lines. They are given names by way of different scientists who discovered them. Curry lines, Hartman lines, then there are water veins. And when first I saw this, I questioned then what is the right way to be? Because every part of the earth seemed to have some or the other line passing. But then the fact is, the good part is, the area of concern is wherever these intersect. Now, in this case, you can see if they are intersecting on top of a bed, especially in the bedroom, then it becomes a matter of concern. This is actually done, proven way back by George Lakowski, uh, Gustav von Paul, uh, sorry. What he did was he mapped uh, in, in Bavarian town, he mapped almost 50 locations and uh, he tracked the location with geopathic stress. And then another body of, uh, you know, uh, medical uh, doctors they found that in that town, there uh, almost all the cancer patients, they were sleeping on the same spots, or they had their house on the sp same spot where Gustav von Paul had identified geopathic stress. <coughs> Since 1930, there has been extensive research papers. You can check this these out. These are all available online. You can go to even my website wherein there's a lot of information about it, that there was a study published that there were 700 cases documented worldwide with terminal cancer patient had regained their health without any treatment after their sleeping area has been moved to geopathic stress. So in case you know anybody who is suffering from cancer and without any reason, let their treatment go on, but suggest, you can suggest to them that try changing the bed location of that patient. And in many cases, we have seen that it starts changing the game for the patient. In Vienna, 1989, there was a 
report of a conference which said that the locational load effect of the disturbed zone on the regulatory system of human organism is proved without doubt. I mean, this lady, Austrian lady researcher, Keith Backler, she has surveyed, done a lot of work on school children, and which showed that 95% of school children with learning disabilities, hyperactive tendencies, or continuous bad behavior, they were either sleeping on a geopathically stressed uh, point, or they had their school desk on both. So that was a very telling thing. And she also checked sample of 500 cancer cases. Every one was found to be sleeping on harmful radiations. So this is our very own Indian research on geopathic stress. This is available on the Indian Journal of Science and Technology. You can check it out. And it stipulates the impact of geopathic stress on the vital functioning of human body, the blood pressure, the heart rate. These are this is this is just a glimpse of one of the uh, cases that I have done here. Uh, a friend of mine, his house, he was a doctor himself, and he developed brain tumors suddenly, and within six months, he was no more. And when eventually his wife invited me to uh, study uh, the space, I found that right where there was a bed head, his bed head, there was a geopathic stress line intersection node with a very high intensity. You can see this radius of the circle implies the intensity. So we suddenly got concerned about the lady also because she was also staying in the same zone. And when we measured, she also had her Sahasrara chakra, which is, which, which is a crown chakra, also depleted to just 5%. And then, of course, we did certain measures here to neutralize this. But this is something, uh, just a quick share of own experience. So some thoughts. With such definitive scientific research on geopathic stress, it's amazing that it does not figure anywhere in architectural curriculum till now. One wonders why medical science is not utilizing the research done on geopathic stress to benefit the patients, especially those suffering from cancer and tumors. And now I have started for past few years, started working with doctors who are open minded. And we are now looking at designing medical facilities wherein we can start looking at all these factors. I, I'll talk about it a little later. But first, let's recap all the five stories. We talk about biofield. We talked about electromagnetic radiation. We talked about vitalized water, pyramid power, and geopathic stress. But there are many more stories which I cannot cover in this uh, forum. Indoclimate, biogeometry, universal mathematics, sleep direction, circadian rhythms, plant energy, volatile organic compounds, colors and frequencies, grounding, Vedic Vastu, natural materials and radiation free zones. Now the big question is, can we design spaces integrating all these principles that we talked about? And that is the basis of bioenergetic architecture that it tries to look at shape and forms, which includes biogeometry and things like pyramids. It tackles something called as building biology, which talks about five different domains, geobiology, radiobiology, endoclimate, electrobiology, and materials. We talk about universal mathematics, and many of you must have heard about fractals, golden ratio, and how the entire nature is constituted with that algorithm. It talks about the precepts of Vedic Vastu. I, I, that's, that's a unique story uh, I have not covered here, but maybe if you're interested, we might touch upon it. We talk about which talks about subtle energy radiations, the Panchamahabhuta, the five elements and the directional influences. Then there's consciousness, the biofields of the plants, the animals, colors, frequencies, water, we talked about it, and grounding. It's, it's a whole amazing thing, the grounding itself. So how to bring all these things was the attempt with which bioenergetic architecture was created. It's an initiative to create space that can 
facilitate health, happiness and harmony in the lives of those those spaces wherein you just have to be and you would be healthy and happy just being there. Now, many of you may not be aware of the subject of building biology, so I'll just take two minutes to introduce what it is. You know, uh, imagine nature, human beings and built environment and in the zone of intersection lies building biology. And it's talking about many things like alternating fields, electric fields, electromagnetic radiations, ions, static fields, molds, magnetic fields, particles and fibers, formaldehydes, VOCs, humidity, and more. So what, who formed this bi building biology? You know, after uh, World War II, uh, there was a lot of destruction. And uh, especially in Germany, when they started rebuilding, they brought in new technologies to build fast. Suddenly they realized that there were a lot of people falling in these newly made houses. And that's when one Dr. Schneider, he started uh, research and he found that there was something about the spaces or the materials and the way they were built that was affecting the biology of the inmates. And that gave rise to a domain called building biology. So when I started my research, I got to know about this and that is when I learned about it and uh, it's it's quite amazing. So, you know, this I'm showing you this thing that nowhere in the world were safe standards, not so safe standards for all these things established. So IBM became one of the first institutes. And now, of course, there are many bodies who give their own versions, governmental bodies, but for various reasons and not pointing fingers here, all of those values are almost thousands of time higher than the values which are considered safe by Institute of Building Biology. We'll, we'll talk about it in another forum sometime. But now when we come to a question that, you know, how will the architecture of the new decade, the coming decade look like? It looks like, yes, it will have all the components of a good responsible architecture that we are used to plus there may be a component of well-being added to the design as a layer of design you know just like green buildings are a layer of design you know they are not something different similarly architecture for well-being the bioenergetic architecture is an additional layer of design process itself and perhaps that would lead us to architecture for health happiness and Harmony. So, if you were to quickly understand why bioenergetic architecture, the idea is to create architecture for well being, understand that buildings impact our biology, address the unprecedented radiation challenge, and celebrate and systematically incorporate rich Vedic science of well being in our design. What is it? It's a dimension of architectural design that deals with the relationship of built spaces and human well being. It employs holistic design approach and protocols to design spaces which enhance and reinforce human biofield. And it offers a methodology of space design that is based on underlying principles of matter, energy and life itself. And it's rooted in multiple sciences like biophysics, building biology, Vedic Vastu and semantics and more. <clears throat> and how do we work with uh, bioenergetic architecture. So biofields, we have talked about all these things earlier. These are all the various components that come into play besides the normal architectural design. But the idea was, and which has been a part of my main research, is how to put them into a systematic format, a protocol-based thing, and that is where the nine precepts of bioenergetic architecture were introduced, which are field-free space, Indoor climate, vitalized water, luminosity, telluric fields, Ubuntu, shape science, materiality, and Ayadi Vastu. We have already spoken about these four today, you know, these four stories. And uh, uh, perhaps uh, if you're interested in the other ones, I'll tell you how. Now comes the moot question. 
what is the touch point between bioenergetic architecture and the uh, topic of this forum, sustainability? So now you see, we talked about all of this. You imagine, just focus on this one thing called Ubuntu. I'll just quickly touch upon it here. <clears throat> Ubuntu means I am because we are. You know, I'll tell you a small story. There was a journalist who went to Africa to study a tribe. And he studied the tribe and he was coming back and he was waiting for some transport at the village. And uh, there were some kids around him. And he said, okay, just to while away the time, let, let me play a game with them. So he had a box of sweets or maybe fruits. And he kept that at a certain distance under the tree and asked all the kids to stand in a line. And then he said that when I say go, you all have to run and whosoever reaches there first gets the fruits or the sweets. Then when they started the game and he said go, you know what they did? They all held each other's hand and ran towards it together. He was baffled because all of them reached there together, took the sweets and everybody started enjoying and eating it. And when he asked them, why did you not run alone? That's when those kids, so-called illiterate, underdeveloped species, they told him this word Ubuntu. That's the traditional knowledge which says, I am because we are. My well-being is dependent on the collective well-being. And what better time than pandemic can we talk about this? Because we have all understood in our own way that how important that my well-being is not independent of the well-being of the planet and the people. So collective well-being implies the well-being of the people and the planet. And true sustainability arises from realizing that green architecture alone is not enough. Living the spirit of Ubuntu, having a sustainable mindset and lifestyle are equally important and need of the hour. So Ubuntu with the sense of people and planet is what brings in sustainability in true sense. You know why I'm telling this, emphasizing on this point? Because earlier through bioenergetic architectural stories, you notice that we are integrally dependent on water, earth, light. And that's all that is being bestowed by the nature. But somehow sustainable architecture comes as an add on. And I have myself designed platinum rated industrial building, gold rated campuses and they are all very good steps in the right direction, I would say. Nothing wrong against it. It's a good step. But you know what I have observed is, until or unless the users of those facilities are thinking green, their true impact cannot be realized. Just to give you an example, how many of you are aware of conferences on green architecture going on for three days? And every day in every session, there's a small plastic bottle of water kept on every delegate's table, half drunk, sometime just wasted. And at the end of three days, we have got 500 bottles of plastic lying there. And we are talking of green architecture often. I have designed green buildings wherein people, it's, it's an amazing circuitry, but people using those buildings, there is one person sitting with 20 fans on, 20 lights on. So it's a green building, but that person doesn't have green consciousness to switch on only the one that is required by him or her. In the same way, there is a good example that I've seen many people. We have got green buildings and uh, we use printers and every printer has usually have got a back to back print command. But so many times, even in our offices, we have seen people are not conscious that even a simple print command using a paper on two sides can bring some kind of sustainability in our lifestyle. What I have come to a conclusion is it is not enough to just have green buildings. It's enough in needed to have green citizens, green thought processes. And that's why the idea of introducing you 
to bioenergetic architecture and ubuntu is is a main aspect of it and green aspect is sustainable aspect is not only through green architecture there are many other aspects through which ubuntu can be realized so in case you want to go deeper into it what i I'll, I'll, i'll talk about it later i want to show you how all these things can be realized in a real time project so i've just taken one project and uh, we'll 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 then wind up this is a project of a small house now this is a house on a non cardinal plot non cardinal means the plot is not according to the east west north south which is also a requirement of vastu some of you may be aware of it so i'll quickly tell you that you know how this this was how we got the plot we did certain calculations as per vastu created segments amazing client he gave me a lot of good brief and then we did many iterations finally we created the axis with the north south because there is a geomagnetic and that's perhaps a talk for another day or perhaps uh, you could find it on the website that how geomagnetism is relevant to good living then we brought in some balance from was to energy point of view and we started bringing universal mathematics there were three main components in the golden ratio which came, which became the basis of the house and that is how eventually this house this design evolved and today it is under construction the client was very happy he gave me a very nice testimonial and i'll i'll quickly take you through a small clipping uh, which will show you uh, a bit more about this house yes it's it's a uh, very uh, difficult to explain all aspects of bioenergetic architecture in uh, a short time i just wanted to give you a teaser that sustainability needs to go to the next level and well being architecture of well being is inherently dovetailed into a sense a deeper sense of sustainability and we can execute it in many ways uh, there is this website you can go you can register free Lee and all the new articles. There's a lot of research I have posted on resources there, in case you are interested. And very soon, uh, within just a matter of month or so, I'll be launching this book and all other precepts and how to work with them. That is explained. In case uh, you are interested, you can just uh, log into the website with your email. Perhaps I'll intimate you. And these are the other ways uh, you can check out and. Uh, stay in touch for other questions so now uh with that i thank you and uh, i would invite all your questions and discussions uh 
Uh, I'll unshare my screen, Girish, if that's okay. Sir, thank you so much. Sir, thank you so much for your presentation. I think it was very, followed the video, I mean, lecture through and through. Is a great lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful to look at the various perspectives of building design. We as civil engineers, we just think it is either cement, concrete, mortar, and all these things. But looking at uh, even the minute aspect of light and sound, uh, a, a, a telephone, for example, I, I, I didn't, we didn't really know that such such aspects modify our life uh, to a great extent. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I think we have a few questions. Uh, uh, one question is from, okay, this is not a question, it's a suggestion. Uh, on the chat box, uh, Girish BS from RV College of Architecture. Uh, wonderful session, very informative uh, on bioenergetic architecture. He wants to know your contact uh, and uh, details so that he could get in touch yes, with you. Uh, Girish, yes, Girish, uh, uh, I hope you could uh, take uh, connect, uh, take the yeah, yeah. Uh, contact details from the last, last slides. You are free to contact me on any of these platforms and yeah, sure. So if there is any other aspect which is new, anything that you want to know about something, feel free because, you know, I had a time limit. So I have just taken four or five stories. So feel free to talk uh, and share. Okay, sir, uh, probably Girish mm -hmm. wants to talk something. Yes, Girish, you can go ahead. Yes, Dr. Jyoti. Yes, sir, you're on you, you are on unmuted. You can you can go ahead with your question. Uh, in the meantime, we have few more questions here, sir. Uh, how do we how do we identify lines of geopathic stress? Uh, this question comes from uh, Professor Sri Devi. Professor Sri Devi. Since time immemorial, there was this culture of dowsing which was used by ancient people. And there is a field called Redistatia. Redistatia is a field of science which understands that human body is one of the most sensitive antenna ever made. And when you are able to, and just like we understood in this discussion that human body and biofield gets impacted by its environment. Redistatia is fundamentally based on this concept that if the, with practice and with some tools, we are able to tap that change in our biofield into a physical reaction. That is the basis on which dowsing happened. And since hundreds of years, people have been using these dowsing rods, L rods. Then eventually in Germany, liquor antenna was used, H3 gold antenna was used. In India, there are various scanners which are being used. You need to have training to use these instruments. At the same time, just like any instrument, which is a scientific instrument, every instrument has got a threshold and has got a level of accuracy or inaccuracy. And that comes with this science also. So one is the field of redistatia instruments with which you can detect the lines. Another thing is that most of these uh, lines have got distorted natural earth magnetism. So usually if you are aware of earth magnetism, we have got uh, about 25 nano Tesla on equator. Agar aap, if, if you open your cell phone and a magnetometer, it would show something like 40 to 55 nano Tesla. So that is because we are in tropics. When you go towards the poles, the magnetic lines, they get together and it becomes about 60, 65 nano Tesla. What happens is whenever there is a geopathic stress line, this magnetism, the earth gets distorted. 
And remember, that's why we, when we were discussing uh, geopathic stress, we said it is most important. It does not happen at the bedroom. Why? Because at night time, our body goes into a recuperative mode. It regenerates itself. During that time, if it, the environment has got some distortion, because magnetic magnetism is something that we have evolved into. If that fundamental field is distorted, then our recuperation of the cell, the cleaning process gets impacted. And that is how cancer or other diseases gets uh, start happening. So because magnetism is getting uh, affected, so scientists, contemporary scientists have found devices like geomagnetometers. These are very sensitive magnetometers which can find the variation in the Earth's magnetism distortion in it. But the problem is Earth's magnetism is very, very weak, very mild. And any kind of underground metal material, even a car standing nearby can impact the reading. So again, it's not a very accurate way. So the kind of accuracy or inaccuracy that we have with contemporary instruments is the kind that are associated with uh, Redistatia based instruments. I personally use Redistatia based instruments <coughs> for uh, my purpose. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, sir, am I audible? This is Girish. Uh, yes, Girish, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, actually, I work for an architecture college, uh, RV College of Architecture, and uh, I felt your uh, uh, presentation is very, very helpful for an architect to make uh, any architecture as a bioenergetic architecture. And uh, my question is, what is the direction an architecture or architect or architecture student should go ahead to make all the uh, the practice or the design as a bioenergetic architecture? So that's a, a simple question that is running in my mind. <laughs> Thank you, first and foremost, for your appreciation. Uh, yes. Girish, yes. this is my life mission. When I started searching into this, the idea was that I have done enough of scale footage. Now, how to bring in this thing for everybody and uh, that's why when bioenergetic architecture was formed way back in 2019 since then i have been working closely with many architectural colleges many architectural studios and have developed talks workshops and now very soon uh, the idea is to come out with this book which can be kept into the libraries but really this would give a you can say a snapshot into what it is. It will be more than this talk. The book will give you a lot more information, case studies, how it can be used, how non-architects can also benefit from it. That's the main part of this. Bioenergetic architecture is not only for designers. It is for everybody. Now, when we have to go to further how to apply it into project, that is where I hold workshops and very soon not very soon it will take a couple of months that perhaps uh, online courses would also develop and right now spa they have invited me uh, for running talks on this i keep giving these talks modules to students in various colleges anyways so that is how the uh, effort to disseminate this information has started and uh, you know when i was a student green building that we know today the culture of green building was at this stage way back 30 years ago you know there were one or two green buildings there used to be one seminar few people who would get to know so then it took two decades and today green architecture is known to most people right they are sorted courses so i guess that would be the path these are uh, initial days and uh, this is my passion so anytime RV college or all this stuff uh, feels uh, like this, uh, you know, we could think of some ways. Why not? That's yeah, I definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely contact you, sir. Uh, uh, I request you to kindly respond back when, as and when I contact you. Sure. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Not, not a doubt, Girish. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. In fact, uh, that remem uh, reminds me, if you go to my website in 2019, oh, 
with COVID, one has lost the sense of time. It was 2019, I think, that uh, I did a Pan India tour of uh, talks, and I had four talks in uh, Bangalore. And uh, one of the talks was uh, at the Center for Soft Power. One was at Maya Praxis. Maya Praxis is a design studio in Bangalore. And uh, there is a very famous structural consultant, Mr. Manjunath, uh, in Bangalore. Then he had called, invited me to his office. And whatever I have shared with you, this is the kind of uh, talk series that went on pre-COVID. But then, you know, uh, there are many, many things that I do in offline things. Many, many experiments I do in offline to make people realize what is biofield, which I cannot do online, you know. So that's the limit. So I stopped doing a lot of things during COVID. But of late, I think uh, one has learned how to go ahead. So I would say that whatever you have gained through this session is, I would say, 30% or maybe 25% of what gets communicated in a real life session. You know, because now you understand in the real life session, our biofields are also interacting. Huh? It's not only visual and here even I cannot see the faces. So it's very difficult for that communication to come on online thing. So well, one has to live with those with, with a smile anyways. So any other question, please feel free. I think uh, Dr. Jyoti has one question. Ma Hello, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Jyoti from Government Engineering College, Ramnagar. Uh, it was a very, very nice, excellent session, sir. Knowledge uh, uh, enhancing. Uh, sir, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you uh, showed uh, a slide of uh, this uh, seed growing uh, experiment. Uh, you uh, told that uh, uh, structured water and normal water. Uh, I could not understand. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah. So when uh, I wanted to experiment that, does structured water really impact us? Okay, because there are various gadgets which are available for this. But how to really know that a particular water is structured or not? Of course, there was a distinct taste change. I could realize that. But sometimes that's not enough. So I carried out an experiment that ultimately what happens is any living, anything which is good for me is what is good for life form, right? So how to do experiments? If we do it on human beings, then their mind comes into the picture, what we call as placebo effect. So best was to do it with plants. Plants do not, do not have placebo effect, if you understand what I'm trying to say. So I chose plants and seeds which grow very fast and I tried to give them water of two different natures. So in my house, I had set up a water system which is unstructured, normal water the way it comes from overhead tank. And on another line, I had put this gadget which gives structured water. So now I have been using structured water for more than uh, two years. Now, for the experiment, we took two similar set of uh, seeds, nine seeds in each set, and we placed them, them in the similar light conditions in the same location. And every day, we gave them to one set of seeds, we gave structured water, to another set, we gave normal water. Now, because the nature of the water, as you saw in the video, the scientist was speaking, it is the same which facilitates the cellular absorption much faster. So we saw that there was a distinct growth, almost 50% faster growth in the seeds which got structured water. As compared to the seeds which were getting the water that we, no we normally drink. So this was the takeaway. I would not say I call these investigations, you see. I am not a scientist as such, and neither are these controls in uh, conditions. An experiment is done in controlled conditions. So I would say at best, this is something that I used as an investigation to give a pointer. Yes, it's not 
five percent, ten percent, twenty. It's a fifty percent increase. Then I repeated that experiments after six months, twice, thrice, and every time those results were consistent. So what means if that water is beneficial for a seed, which is a life form, it is uh, beneficial, going to be beneficial for any life form, including human beings. Would I answer your question? Jyoti, ma'am, I hope your, your question is answered. Okay. Uh, fine. Sir, uh, Raman, sir, thank you so much once again for the presentation. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can connect on other platforms as well. Of course, this was a platform where faculties were there. I think uh, such knowledge should reach even the student fraternity as well, uh, wherein they could also... Uh, they could also think of uh, such uh, presence elements of elements of a building a composition contribute much more uh, towards uh, say uh, eco-friendly or a happier uh, living uh, i think uh, that could be the order of the day going forward uh, i agree with you Gaish, and uh, i would add here that this is not something restricted to designers or architects at all Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. Uh, subsequently, yes. if you go and check the website or maybe check out the book, it pertains to anybody and everybody because whether it's gravitation, whether it's uh, magnetism, geomagnetism, whether it's water, Vedic Vastu, all these things are impacting everybody equally. So even if I don't design the house, I can perhaps reorient my bed in the right direction. Yes. I can perhaps start using grounding. I can do so many simple things in my life, regardless of space design, which uh, I can benefit. And definitely, I'm very happy to be speaking to Forum of Teachers here because uh, we as teachers have got so much ability to impact the thought process of our students, should we choose to do it rightly. And in that lies the potential of spreading out because health happiness and harmony is something everybody is seeking in some way or the other today so whether it is architecture students that's where i'm very happy in most of the architecture colleges i uh, give talk uh, i especially focus on the teachers and the senior students who are going to go into the field and uh, of course then there are uh, there are sessions uh, which are workshops for design studios because see everybody doesn't have time to go into all this depth and what happened was past two years onward many design studios started approaching me that you please step in as a consultant at the concept design stage with with us so uh, you know ayadi vastu is a very very specific thing which has got many calculations in it it's it's very different than the vastu that most of us know then similarly, many other aspects of bioenergetic architecture, right from the manner in which do you do the wiring, how do you make Wi-Fi's in the house? We need internet, we need Wi-Fi, but what to do to make it safe? So many of you would have that question perhaps. For that, you can just go on Instagram, Facebook or website and you would see a lot of material which you can read. And this is a stuff that is required by students by us, because everybody is using six hours, eight hours of Wi-Fi or screen today. So my body right now is getting impacted by the screen. By the and by the way, I don't use Wi-Fi. I found a better way around it. Uh, but uh, of that later on. Uh, what I want to urge is uh, that now working with design studios, then slowly clients started coming to me that we want to get such things made, and because. You know, I have got paucity of time, I'm teaching, I'm researching, I'm working with studios. So what I do is I make concept design packages, the kind you just saw, you know, the house at Ayodhya. And we make these packages and then we give it to the client and then we guide the local architects, <coughs> sorry, and engineers uh, to develop it further. So just a knowledge of these basic things, suppose those people have read the book or understood or you know, uh, many of many places these talk which are recorded soon, I'll be 
launching a YouTube video uh, channel also. These will be available there. So just a basic knowledge of this can help many people uh, without a formal training as such. Uh, one just needs to have an interest into health and well-being. And I'm sure I always welcome uh, positive thoughts and you can always be in touch with me uh, through the emails on my website. Uh, so I, with that, I think I'll uh, thank you also, Girish, and uh, for this uh, good forum and wish you all the very best for the remaining sessions. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank you, you so sir. much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Balakshmi, ma'am. Do you want to conclude on the session or shall we? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. The presentation was uh, very informative and uh, with the videos and animation, it was excellent. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and uh, giving us time and knowledge. All the best. All the best. Thank you, Dr. Subhrak. Thank you, sir. I log out now and all the best to all of the participants. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So we'll go for a break for uh, half an hour. Then we'll join back for the afternoon session, the third session for the day, the last session at two o'clock. Thank you all. Ma'am, at two fifteen. Uh, I will just start at two, sir. We'll just check with the speaker, and by okay. the time we start, it will be at two fifteen. Okay. Okay. Done. Thank you, sir.